so um, pretty much all the other classes we had, we were really talking about uh, particular mathematical tools. Um, and today I want to talk about actually sort of some phenomena that you see in complex systems. So we did talk about chaos, which is a phenomenon you see in complex systems. You can also think about it as a, um, a property of these sort of mathematical equations and systems of equations that we, <coughs> that we wrote down in the first couple of classes. Um, today I want to talk about collective behavior and look at some first look at some systems that exhibit collective behavior, some real physical systems. And as we go along today, we'll see that every single thing, as you just saw in those two presentations, there was nonlinear dynamics, there was chaos, you know, dynamical systems, there was networks. Um, we'll see fractals, power models. But everything we built up, this entire mathematical toolkit that we built up, uh, is going to sort of come back to that. And we're going to realize that this stuff is actually useful for understanding actual complex systems. So, um, I guess the first thing I would say is when we think about organization, we typically think about somebody designing something, like an architect with a blueprint, or um, a musician designing a composition, and or, or uh, people building a house or something. We think about organization has to come from some sort of intelligent design. Um, uh, but that's not really the case in nature. There's lots of examples of things that sort of self-organize. So that's the term that you self-organize. Um, so these things here are all, uh, let me just go through these. This is just uh, a salt crystal, so that's uh, the greens, one of them sodiums, one's chlorines, and that's what salt crystal looks like when you, uh, when it's in solid state, so that's just a typical solid. We don't want to think about that, but somehow that thing sort of comes together, self-organizes. And in physics, if you, you guys have probably all taken thermodynamics before, um, or some version of that. And you learn about something called the second law of thermodynamics, which says that if you have a system that's closed, meaning there's no particles that can flow in or out, there's no energy that can flow in or out, there's no heat that can flow in or out, um, the system will go naturally go from an ordered state, maybe like that over there, to a disordered state where everything's sort of random. This is like the increase in entropy. Entropy is the, the term that you can use for this. Um, and so that's sort of mysterious when you think about well, we have all these things, including us, these human beings, that are very organized, um, and you know we're, we exist in the physical world. So what's going on? And the important part is closed. The word closed. So everything we're, that we're looking at here, and I'll explain these in a second. Um, and basically, all the organization that we see in nature are open systems. They can exchange energy and particles with the environment. Um, and so they have this ability to not disobey the second law of thermodynamics. They don't fit into the category that the second law uh, is explaining. And they're able to sort of spontaneously organize when you just put them together. And the way they're doing this is because of the interaction between the parts. So what you need is you need a system that's open, it can exchange energy with the environment, has lots of maybe identical, maybe different parts, so like the sodium uh, chloride crystal over there has two different types of uh, atoms, um, then you need some sort of interaction between those parts. And at least in some cases when you have that, you can get really beautiful uh, spontaneous organization. So the salt crystal is not so interesting. We've all seen a picture like that before. This thing right here is a similar picture with a bunch of different types of atoms and molecules. And this is a cuprate. This is a uh, high temperature superconductor. This is trying to understand why it superconducts at high temperatures. But the point is just to look at, it's quite complicated. Right? You, get, you get multiple atoms coming together in this complicated crystal, and this structure is repeated over and over again in the actual material. And somehow that particular organization leads to this fantastic property of superconductivity at high temperatures. So that's an emergent property. This is graphene. So these are carbon atoms. And uh, when they're arranged in this particular structure in these sheets, uh, it's the, like one of the strongest materials in the world. Um, but again, they sort of self-organize. You put them together under the right conditions, and you get that pattern. If we didn't stick those atoms together in those shapes on purpose, nature <coughs> self-organizes. These are um, hydro. So these are these are some like long molecules that have a hydrophobic and hydrophilic in. And when you put them in different fluids, they will arrange in different ways. And these are three different sort of phases. You 
um, it's a very interesting organizations. And you just, if I just gave you a bunch of these little things, you probably wouldn't guess this. It would look like they organized together. And then of course this thing, here's a protein, really complicated, tons of atoms in it. Um, and you, and, and you know, every single second, these things are being created and destroyed all the time and all the new things. And they really do all the heavy lifting of life. So all these are examples of self-organization. Um, for things that aren't living. Um, here's a couple other examples. So, uh, this, you all know, sand and its waves. You might have asked yourself, why is that? Also, if you go to a beach and you look under the water, in the shallow part, um, you can see a pattern like this on the, uh, it's like sort of ridges of sand. Uh, you can start off with flat sand or random piles of sand and wait a while, and because of the interaction between the wind and the sand particles with each other, Eventually, this pattern breaks. Um, this is really interesting. This looks complicated, but it's quite simple to do. So if you just take some cooking oil in a pan uh, and you start heating it up, first it just sort of looks uniform. It doesn't look interesting like this. If you heat it up enough, um, it's not boiling. If you just make the temperature difference between the top and the bottom big enough, you get convection. Um, it's not really important exact details, but the point is, you go from a just regular liquid to something with these uh, cells. This is called uh, uh, Raleigh-Bernard convection. And so this is a top-down view. Each of these cells has fluid flowing up and then coming back down in a particular pattern to create this shape. And then this is really cool. This is, this is the um, the losov zabotinsky reaction. It's a chemical reaction. Um, uh, Steven Sergat's also studied this a bit and talks about that in that same book. You just mix the chemicals together and you watch the thing react and you get this kind of uh, pattern just by chemical reaction. So that's quite interesting. Yeah. Again, they're all non-living things, but they're all examples of self-organization. Okay, then we have life. So life itself is self-organization. Um, there's some simple life. There's all sorts of proteins and stuff that have self-organized together, and they self-organize into this big uh, um, big cell, and uh, so it's an example of self-organization. This thing is a slime mold. The slime molds are um, a, a fungus. They're a bunch of individual cells, and in certain conditions, they sort of merge together, and they act as one sort of collective organism. It's one of the simplest and most interesting examples of like single cell to multicellular, and, and they transfer back and forth between the two phases during the life cycles. Um, and so these slime molds, you can see them you can actually see these things. So what they do is they the cells come together and they can move around and explore space and they can solve mazes and all sorts of crazy things. Okay, this is a, a bunch of bees. When they're trying to find a new nest, what they do is they all um, get together in this big bunch and hang from a tree. So there's nothing holding them up; they're holding each other up. And the queen's in the middle; they're protecting her. And none of the bees. There's no leader. The queen's not saying, you pick, move together, or whatever, it's getting too hot in here, give me some air. Um, they're all adjusting to local information, and in the end, what you get is this, um, these channels going through this thing that allow air to flow in and out so you can regulate the temperature and protect the queen. Um, <coughs> this is in winter, I think, so it's colder. And then these are, this is an example of firefly synchronizing. So this is a snapshot of a bunch of fireflies, and uh, I think in Virginia or Kentucky or something. Um, and this is the moment when they're all flashing at the same time. And so again, not, not, there's no leader here. They all started off just like Luke was showing us, um, sort of out of phase. Both of you guys talked exactly about this. Like Kevin and Luke, again, great examples of this stuff. Because those are all examples of uh, self-organization. So they start off out of phase and they end up in phase. Okay, and then finally, um, these are bird, these are starlings. So they're a particular type of bird that likes to flock in these massive flocks of, uh, I think, like on the order of a thousand birds at a time. And they make these really complicated shapes. And uh, bird flocking, people used to think there might be a leader of the bird flock or something like that, but there is no, they've studied this enough, there is no leader. The same is true with uh, schools of fish. There's no leader here. Um, they're all just sort of adjusting the local information about what their neighbors are doing. You get these complicated patterns. And then finally, traffic jams. So this doesn't look like a typical traffic jam. This is an experiment. 
Um, but you might think, oh, why is, the, you know, if you're driving on the highway, especially 880 during rush hour, you'll notice that there are pockets of completely stopped traffic and there are places where you're going at normal speed. And you might guess that those places where you're completely stopped are due to an accident. But then you pass through and you don't see an accident. You, see, you get upset and say, why the hell is there a traffic jam here? Well, it turns out it's a collective uh, sort of behavior. So what they did, this experiment, what they did, they took a bunch of people in cars, they had them drive around at a constant speed, and they were all adjusting to each other. If they got too close to somebody, they you know, let off the gas a little bit, just like we would when we were driving. Clearly, there's no accidents going on here. But what you get is you get a wave. So here, the cars, there's like a jam. They're all very, uh, there's like a dense area of cars here, and they're moving slowly. Uh, here, it's not very dense, they're moving faster. And there's a video of this. I don't have it here. But you can see that this dense pocket sort of moves around in this direction. Um, and it's not always the same cars. So these cars are going fast now, and a little bit will be going slow and will be stuck in the traffic jam. So you get this wave, just, it looks exactly like a little shot. It's this wave that's moving around. It's a uh, traffic jam. So pretty much everything imaginable, we have uh, collective behavior. Um, and here's my final example. Even patterns on animals. So somehow in the process of development, as the cells are dividing, um, and different parts of the, the genome are being expressed in different cells, you get these patterns emerging. Um, like a snake, a cheetah or something, uh, a giraffe and a zebra, familiar patterns. They're all very interesting. Um, and they're all unique. They're not the same for every single animal. They look similar, but if you look at one giraffe and another giraffe, their patterns are unique. And then here is this uh, shell, and it has also a really good Disney pattern on it. So, Again, okay, another example of self organization. Okay, so hopefully I've convinced you that it's a common thing in nature. Um, so I want to talk about the word self organization. Why do we call it self? There's a whole bunch of uh, particles in these systems, a whole bunch of. So from now on, every time I talk about a system, I'm going to call each thing an atom. Um, so in this case, each atom is, the, is each cell. Uh, in this case, the atoms are the cars, or the birds, or the fish. Here they're the bees, or the individual cells of the slime mold, or the fireflies. Here they're the, um, the uh, fluid particles, yeah, the fluids. So the fundamental pieces in the system, the things that aren't changing, I'm going to call atoms. And then we have interactions between Any questions so far? Questions about these pictures? I'll put some quotes for now. Um, what we need is we need a system of particles that I'm going to call atoms. And they're usually identical, but they don't have to be. Um, but we typically understand all the properties of them. We know the sort of properties of the atoms that aren't changing. And then we also have interactions between them. And the reason it's called self is because these are the only two things that are causing the organization. Um, so another, another example of organization that's not self-organization, but maybe doesn't have a leader, is imagine you have some food source and a bunch of animals run towards it. So first you just have an empty area with some food there, then you have a whole group of animals, you might think, well, that's organization, there wasn't a leader, but each of them are acting independent. They're all going towards the food source. There's no interaction between them. So what's causing the organization is not an interaction in that case. Um, if you have a leader of the group, that's not an interaction that's causing, that's not an interaction with each other that's causing the organization, that's an interaction with each individual and the leader. So in self-organization, what we have is we have, the important thing is we don't just have interactions, we have local interactions between the atoms. And again, atoms are the fundamental parts. So local just means you have information just about your atoms. You don't have information about the whole system. And that's true for all the things that you show. 
Um, and so then this, the word self does really refer to uh, the whole system. That's what the self is in this case. So it's kind of a strange term, but it's hard to think of a better one. And this is the one that's used in the literature. Now, something that's been brought up before about self-organization is what we really couldn't, shouldn't call self-organization, because in all of these cases, we have to control something externally to make them work. So in this case, we have to add some heat to the bottom of it with a Bunsen burner or a hot plate. We have to turn up the heat to a certain level. Uh, in this case, there's this wind that's blowing it. In that case, you know, somebody actually has to mix the chemicals together in the right ratios. Um, in the case of the cars, the traffic jam isn't going to work just for any uh, Actually, I'm not sure. They don't know if we'll traffic jam. So you might imagine that if everybody was driving really slowly at 10 miles per hour, you would never get a traffic jam. So maybe only the traffic jam occurs for some range of speeds. So there is something sort of external to the system. Um, but what it, what's really doing is in all these cases, you're controlling some internal pressure. So think about what Luke was just doing. He was sitting here and he was controlling the parameters, the frequency of oscillation or the coupling between them, and that allowed us to see these different sort of phases, these different modes of collective behavior. Um, when we're increasing the heat uh, in, the, um, in the fluids here, we're also tuning some parameter, we're controlling some parameter in the system. The important part is we're not organizing the system. All we're doing is we're tuning the interaction between individual particles. And, and then the interaction between the particles is the thing that causes self-organization. So that's the important part. The interaction are the causal, are the causal part here. They cause the organization. So these two things, interactions causing organization and than being local interactions. So there's no global information about the system that any single particle has are the two important keys for self-localization. Okay. So um, another example to make it a little bit more clear is if uh, the most common, the, the, the first self-organizing thing you learned about is phase transitions from uh, gaseous H2O, liquid H2O, to solid H2O. And, um, in that case, what we're doing is we're, we're tuning the temperature. We're changing the temperature in order to get things to organize in one phase or the other phase. And by tuning the temperature, we're really controlling sort of the strength and effect, the strength of the interactions between the atoms. Um, but still, it's the interactions between the atoms that make it self organized If I take, if I have a room that's, you know, negative 10 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 10 degrees uh, Celsius, and I take some liquid water, or take some gas and I just throw it in there, it will freeze, it will self-organize. So it really is the interactions between the particles and the process. Okay. Um, any questions about that? So at this point, everybody clear on my self-organization? Maybe another way of saying the same thing or less is uh, the, the self is what emerges from the interactions. Yeah. The cells are what emerge, and that's how the word self is right. meant to be. Right. So, um, exactly. So the thing, sort of the system, uh, when, when it organizes, initially you might have had individual pieces, now you have a sort of collective piece that's acting together. And that's the thing about it's not the best term to self of why it's like intelligence or something. But that's not what it is. Okay. So now I want to talk about, I mentioned this a couple times, but I want to talk about phases and phase transitions. Um, so like I just mentioned, the, the most talked about phases of matter <coughs> are uh, solid, liquid, and gas. Uh, particularly when you think about it in terms of water. And then when you're, I don't know, high school or something, middle school, someone tells you, oh, there's really four phases of matter, there's plasma. The whole thing's kind of bullshit, because there's like lots of phases of matter. 
It's not just three. Um, so these crystal structures I showed you in particular phase of matter. And the cupre, the thing that's a superconductor, is a distinct phase from uh, you know, the ice. So there's lots of different phases. And I want to talk about what a phase means. So just, I'll ask you guys. Uh, if I write down the word phase, Besides thinking of solid, liquid, and gas, what can you tell me? What do you think a, what does a phase represent? What is a phase telling us about what's going on inside the system? What constitutes a phase? Any guesses? Yeah. I think of an order brand. Order. Yeah. Okay, so there's something about order. So gas, gaseous water, and ice have very different organizations. What is this crystal? one just sort of randomly bouncing around. The molecules are randomly bouncing around. So there's something about order that's involved in phases and phase transitions. Um, so another we can think about order or maybe like organization. These two are kind of synonymous. So the name organization mm -hmm. the molecules changes when you change phases. What else? It sort of suggests like a change in type, like a, a jump as, as opposed to a continuous jump. Think of like phases of your life. You know, adolescence is one phase, and adulthood is another phase. And so it's like a, maybe like a, there's a qualitative difference. Qualitative. So there's like some sort of uh, so I'm never talking qualitative, but also we can think about it as maybe emergent in terms of these things. So the reason that water, liquid water, and ice we think about them as qualitatively different is because they have different emergent properties. And so when we interact with them. One, besides one being cold and one not being as cold, one is solid and one can crack and one fractures and the other one doesn't do any of that stuff. So the sort of qualitative, um, qualitative differences between the phases, uh, typically you can think about as difference emergent, different emergent properties. Um, another one that you might not think about in most phases, but sometimes when we talk about phases and phase transitions, we're talking about dynamic systems, systems that have some sort of motion going on inside. And so the dynamics can be different um, for different phases as well. Um, and then the last thing I'm going to write down is symmetry. It's related to this order thing. Um, so actually this down here, I'll talk about this in a second, but in this case, these are, this is a what a, this is sort of a model of a map. Um, and we can think about each of these as being an atom, and each atom has a spin, it's either up or down. Uh, all the spin, the best way to think about spin is these are all like little microscopic magnets. And when you get a big magnet that's magnetic, that means all the spins have lined up. And so you have a whole bunch of microscopic magnets that give you one big magnet. In this case, the spins are flipped randomly. So if I took this picture, I told you guys to close your eyes, I said, look at this, set this picture for a while, close your eyes, and I flipped it upside down, you wouldn't really be able to tell the difference. There's a symmetry. There's a flipping symmetry. You can flip it over, and it looks the same. But here, if I flip it over, you'll obviously tell me the difference. So typically, a change in phase means a change in symmetry. Um, the sort of uh, dramatic term from physics is symmetry breaking. But that's all it means, symmetry changes. Um, and so I want to give you guys some examples of uh, phase transitions. So there's some pictures here. The first one is a colony of bacteria. Um, and if you change the conditions under which the bacteria is growing, you can change the sort of emergent structure of the colony. So by changing the conditions, the temperature, or what you're feeding them, you're changing this. You're changing the local interactions between the individual cells. But what you get is you get a completely different thing. So those things look very different. I don't want to tell you what these are. These are like you know, cells that grow but just by looking at it, you can tell there's a qualitative difference. There's a difference in symmetry. There's a difference in order and organization. Um, we just talked about this one, the icing model. We'll get back to that. Hopefully, you guys played around with that this week with that logo. And this is interesting. Um, this is the optical illusion. So raise your hand if it looks like a glass tube. Or on the first look, it looked like a glass. OK, raise your hand if it looks like uh, two faces. Okay, so. Apparently, um, I'm not an expert in this, 
but when, and I'm sure you've all done this, you can stare at this for long enough and you can make it switch back and forth in your head. There's actually a phase transition taking place in your brain and um, the way you perceive your image. Now that sounds a little bit sketchy. Yeah. Well, part of the evidence for that is that you actually can't do both at once. Even if you think you're doing both at once, you can switch both at once. Yeah. You can't see both interpretations of the image. Yeah. Yeah, so Luke probably knows more about the evidence for this uh, than, than I do. Okay, I've heard that. people refer to it. Oh. <laughs> but it's really interesting. There's evidence that there's actually a phase transition going on in the brain when we're flipping back and forth between these two things. Um, some other examples are uh, proteins. So a protein in a folded state and a protein in an unfolded state are two very different phases. And you can adjust that by changing the temperature. Um, if I go back to these flocks, these three look pretty different. You can imagine maybe there's a phase of flocking or, um, or schooling, it's called the fish, where they're going around in a circle like this, and maybe there's a phase where they're moving forward and they're all following each other. So those could be different phases. Uh, the traffic jam thing. So you can set up the conditions of uh, the cars and the speed they're going at and how quickly people react to the people in front of them. Um, and you can get a nice continuous uh, highway without any traffic jams going on. And then you can change things a little bit you get a phase transition to a traffic jam. Um, and the last one I want to mention is, uh, oh, the little magnet. I guess I didn't make that clear, but what do you think I change? What do you think I tune to go from this to this? This might be a bunch of things, but what's a guess? Temperature. Yeah, it's temperature. I was hoping the, I mean, you're in physics, so obviously you know it's temperature. But it's temperature. So when the temperature is too high, basically temperature is just a bunch of random vibration. And the spins, these things, want to line up with each other, but they can't because the temperature is shaking them around. And when you lower the temperature enough, they stop getting shaken around enough, and eventually they all line up. And you get a phase transition. So we actually already encountered um, a phase transition a couple of times in this class, and we just didn't call it that. So I want to go back to my favorite example, the thing I keep going back to in this class, and that's logistic growth. Um, so remember at the very beginning we wrote down a a, um, so can, it, can do you guys remember what the logistic growth equation is? Can anybody tell me what I should write on the other side of the equal sign? So remember this is like the number of cells or the number of organisms in the population. This is the rate at which they change. And then it looks like this. And we saw that there were two different types of behavior. So over time, you could get uh, behavior that did something like this. So it grows exponentially at the beginning and then it saturates to the carrying capacity, which in this case would just be one, because of the way I've written the equation. Um, or you could do this. You could start somewhere and you could just decay this. These are really two different phases of this system. This is a system of particles, in this case cells or organisms that are growing in the population. Um, and they are interacting. They're interacting because of this second term here, which is basically representing a limited amount of resources. As the population gets bigger, the resources get depleted, and the population saturates. So all the things that we need, local interactions, I guess in this case, they're sort of like average interactions. They're exactly the same thing that Kevin talked about, the mean field interactions. Um, and we can tune a parameter, we can get a phase transition. So in this case, the thing we're tuning is R. And does anybody remember when I get this and when I get this? I'm not going to answer this one. Somebody has to answer it. 
So R has to be bigger than something to get this, and smaller than something to get this. It's either one or zero. So now, you, now everybody else is 50 50 shot. So I'm going take a guess. One. Yeah. <laughs> Especially tricky. I mean, it, it, in, in the discrete case, it's one, in the continuous case, it's zero. So it's kind of a trick question. But in this case, it's, it's zero. So if it's bigger than zero, it does this, and if it's less than zero, it does this. Um, so we sort of stumbled upon what people call critical points. A critical point is the point, uh, the value of the parameter at which you're sort of in between these two regimes. So if r is exactly equal to zero, what you would get is you would just get a flat line. That's called a critical point. So we'll come back to this again, that you keep getting these points between two phases where the transition actually occurs. And it can again occur in multiple different ways. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, so that was kind of a boring example. That's what I talked about, the boring case. What Juana talked about was much more interesting. And this was the discrete case. Um, so in this case, what we had an equation like this. Same thing, except there's not a derivative now, and I'll say difference equation. Um, and I'll just write down what we found. We found that if r was between 0 and 1, the uh, number went to 0. So it looked just like this. So they, they all, the population died away. Um, if r was between 1 and 3, Get, so again, you get some sort of growth, and then you get a saturation, and it saturates at a value of r minus 1 over r. So it doesn't saturate at 1, but it saturates somewhere below 1, but still it sort of looks like this picture here. Okay, so does remember what happens after 3? So qualitatively. Yes, oscillation. So that's very different. That's a qualitative difference, a different emergent behavior when you get oscillation. So if R is between 3 and 3.45, um, you get oscillation between two values. And then if R is between 3.45, 3.54, it's an oscillation between four values. And there's a whole infinite set of things. So that you're going to keep getting this period doubling. You get oscillation two values, four values, eight values, 16 values, so on and so forth. And then eventually, you know, the things oscillate so much that it's in this category. So in this case, there's a whole lot of phases. Each of these is a phase because the sort of emergent qualitative behavior is different. Um, and each of these boundary is a phase transition and a critical point. So which is the right way to model it? Um, it really depends on your system. I mean, so sometimes people use this when they mean this because it's convenient, they can do it with a computer, they can actually solve something like this. But actually in this case, these are two different equations. They represent two different types of dynamics. If you convert this equation into a difference equation, you don't get this. So it depends on what you're trying to model. I have a quick question. Yeah. Not to dwell on that point, but why do they call them both logistic equations if they cover? I just think because they have the same the same form. The same form, yeah. Um, I don't know. It's, it is confusing and it's not really I talked about. But if you actually just Go back to basic calculus. If you turn this into a difference equation, you don't get the same thing. The parameter, well, it looks similar, but the parameter changes. It's not the same R. And I think it's one of the differences. The parameter changes, but the principle is the same. So you still sort of get, I think, you know, you get this oscillation because you still have this carrying capacity, sort of, that, you know, you tend to jump over and then it brings you back. So the principle of how it happens in the fact that this is carrying capacity is the same. Yeah. So that's why you're getting oscillations because you're overshooting and then with the 
continuous, you never ever shoot. So you don't right. get any Okay, so from just looking at this really basic example, we learned a couple of things. Um, one is that you know, both of these, I call these different phases, but you know, in this case, they might not actually look that different at the very beginning of the growth. They only look different sort of in the region where they saturate, or the region when they come into some steady state or stable pattern. So phases, in all cases, represent some sort of stable pattern um, or structure or organization. If they weren't stable, if they were constantly changing, we really couldn't say this thing is a phase. There wouldn't be any thing to call the phase. So in this case, the sort of um, t goes to infinity behavior is the thing that uh, tells you which phase it's in. And if you remember, we've talked about this before, we recognized that these were different fixed points. So some sort of phase space, and when r is bigger than zero, this fixed point up here um, is stable, and when r is less than zero, this one down here is stable. So phases are always, in, the ter in terms of uh, dynamical systems, they're fixed points. Or they're limit cycles. They're some sort of stable pattern. In general, we can just call them attractors. So as you're tuning your parameters, what you're doing is you're changing your landscape, your phase space. And that's changing the stability of different um, equilibrium zones in this uh, phase space. And that's changing where the attractors are. So you can jump from one attractor to another attractor, and that's a phase transition. And that's simply because the stability of the attractor is changing. Um, another thing we recognize is that phases are always collective behaviors. Um, and they always recommend, uh, represent emergent properties. But probably the most important thing is that we have a special name for the point in parameter space when the stability of the fixed points changes. And that was called the bifurcation point. So um, I won't draw that yet, but uh, I'm basically saying, using a whole bunch of terms to mean the same thing. Phase is like the same as an attractor. Um, a phase transition is like the same as a bifurcation. And the critical point is the point we need to bifurcate. So all this stuff ties back into dynamical systems, and really dynamical systems is the right language to talk about these transitions. Okay. Any questions about that? Same. In this case, it looks very different. 
So uh, this sort of has all of the symmetry, and this has broken symmetry. So there's less symmetry in this organ in this sort of organization of the spins than in this organization of the spins. Um, and because of that, we can say that this one, I'll say, sort of full symmetry here. Uh, but no order. And here there is less symmetry. But it's ordered. And again, this is a uh, physicist was called symmetry. So it would be nice if we could come up with some sort of parameter that captures this order that's changing it. And then we can write down some equation with that parameter. And then we could actually use this map that we've been learning to find the uh, phase transition, to find the critical point. Um, so what is your guess? So let me, I'll tell you a couple things about this. At each point in the lattice, with some lattice here, that represents each of these atoms, at each point in the lattice we can either, we can say it's either plus one or minus one. So this would be plus one for up, minus one, minus one, plus one, minus one. Okay? These are each of the lattice points. This is just for the top row. Um, I want some sort of parameter. I'm going to call it phi. That captures this having no order and this having order. Can someone take a guess at what that parameter might be? Or how I might calculate that if I gave you a picture like this? Do you, do you want it to be what? So I want it to be just some parameter, that a, a full system parameter. So it's not going to be defined for each point in space. It's going to be, there's going to be one parameter for this and one parameter for this. And we want to capture the order. So I'll give you a hint. Let's say that phi equals 0 here and phi equals 1 here. The sum of the spin. Yeah, it's the, it's the average. It's the average of the spin. So here, because they're randomly oriented up and down, there's on average an equal number of up and down spins. And so if I add 1 minus 1 minus 1, 1 all together, Take the average, I get zero, and here I get one. Now I could have something in between. Maybe I everything was mostly ordered, but these two guys were pointing down, then it would be slightly less than one. So in this case, the order parameter phi is just going to be the, I can write it like this, if si is the spin at each location, which is the sum over that divided by the number of spins. And in physics, that typically looks like this. That means average. But we can also write like this. Okay? So it's, it's, a, it's an average property. Almost always, the order parameter is an average property. Yes. I, I have a question. Actually, I've wondered this before. But <clears throat> it seems like that term is kind of misleading. Order parameter? Because parameter is usually something that you tune within a set of equations. Versus this is like an output. Or like a, you know, a snapshot of your system. Yeah, that's a good point. So what we were just talking about before, talking about parameters, which are internal to the system. They represented the strength of interactions or something like that. Here, this is something you calculate after the fact. I don't have to know anything about the interactions. I can just look at this picture and I can calculate this thing called the order parameter. I'm using the term order parameter because that's what it's historically used. That's what they call it, but it might not be the best term. So maybe we could call it like the, I don't know what you think it's better. Uh, no, order um, measure. Metric. Measure. Measure. Metric. 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 Yeah. Metrics of measure. Okay, so. Can you talk to the people about this? Yeah, let's, <laughs> let's, just, let's just change this. Um, order metric. Doesn't really matter. It's just, it's, it, the, the point is that it's some parameter that describes the macroscopic, the global properties of the system, and it quantifies the amount of order we have on the system. Um, and typically, in, in the case of the icing model, it's the average. Uh, in a lot of other physical systems, it's the average, but it's not always the average. And sort of the, it's sort of an art to figure out what the order parameter should be. Because you want to come up with a good parameter that quantifies the order, but it's not too hard to calculate. So 
So I can't give you a general recipe for finding the order parameter for any system, but there typically is something that you can call the order parameter and you can use to calculate things. Um, so well, I want to do this now for the ice cream. So did you guys get a chance to read the info section in that logo? that sort of explain what the ISO model is about. Um, I'll remind you over here. There's sort of a few things on top of this general picture. Um, one is that the spins want to align with the neighbors. So they only sort of feel the force from their immediate neighbors, and they try to align to the spins of all neighbors. There's some mathematical way to write it down with physics, but it's not that important. Just remember that they want to align. Um, and like I said before, there's thermal agitation. And that's what's preventing them from aligning. So um, temperature, when you increase the temperature of something, you're increasing the amount of agitation that's in the system. And the spins, you know, want to look like this, where they're all aligned, but they're constantly flipped over by the thermal agitation, and that's sort of fighting against this, this, um, this sort of desire to align. So those are sort of the two competing forces in the icing model. Um, and then I will say that when you have a system like this, so this, this happens in real magnets. When they look like this, they're called a paramagnet, meaning they're only be magnetic if you put them into um, a magnetic field. So you put this into a magnetic field, all the spins will line up. And here, you typically call this a ferromagnet because the spins are always lined up. So these are the things like bar magnets or refrigerator magnets are all lined up all the time. And We know that when the temperature is really, really high, it's going to, it's basically always going to look like this because the agitation is always going to beat out the, um, the attraction to, for the spins to line up. Um, and if we turn the temperature all the way down to absolute zero, there's no agitation. So they're all going to line up without any problem. They're going to look like this. And so the, the problem that we're trying to figure out is where does that transition happen? So the parameter we're tuning is the temperature. We want to find We want to find the critical temperature. The temperature at which it goes from being randomly uh, ordered to an ordered state. And so the critical temperature is the place it goes that the ordered parameter goes from being zero to being bigger than zero. You might think that actually what you expect is that it meets yeah, you turn the tune just below the critical temperature and it jumps from zero to one immediately. But that's not what happens in this case. Um, it just goes from zero to something that's positive. And you can see this in the NetLogo program. They show you this parameter, they call it the magnetization. Um, and if it's above the critical temperature, which they tell you in the info section, you always get zero, or on average you get zero. And as soon as you tune below the critical um, critical point, the phi starts growing. And if you go all the way down to zero, the magnetization goes to one because all the spins are lined up. So you can see that in, the, in this image. So if you actually do the physics, which I'm not going to do, you can get a, a, a differential equation for the order parameter. Um, and it looks something like this. So it's d phi dt, change the order parameter. It's going to equal some parameter mu times phi minus phi cubed. And mu is this. So the only parameter we really have is temperature, and mu is just some function of temperature. Um, and this is the equation we want to examine. So what we want to find is we want to find the fixed points, because that's what the phase really represents. 
So if we try to find the fixed points of this equation, and set it equal to zero, and compare <coughs> phi, and we get this. So we get three different solutions. Um, we always have the solution phi equals zero. And then we also have the solution. If you just solve this equation here, you get that phi equals plus or minus square root of mu. Um, but only if mu is bigger than zero. So what I'm plotting here is I'm going to plot mu, so the mu axis. This is mu equals zero. So when mu is less than zero, the only solution you have is this one, this phi equals zero solution. When mu is bigger than zero, you get two other solutions. They look like this. Um, and these are, so I guess what I'm, what I'm plotting here on this axis is fine. But it doesn't really matter too much. Um, you get these two other solutions. And then the question we have to ask ourselves, so this right here is really a bifurcation point. It's a classic pitchfork diagram. I believe one I talked at least drew one of these. Did you draw one of these? Yeah. Did you drew one of these. Um, so the question now, if we want to figure out what phase it's going to be in, is we need to look at the stability. So I, I'm not going to go into the analysis, but you do exactly what Juan talked about. You name the class to do a stability analysis. And you find that the solution is um, brown wing stable. So it's stable here. It's black. It's stable here which is good because there's only one solution, so we hope it's stable. Um, and then if this is not stable anymore once phi is bigger than zero, but both of these are stable. Okay? So what this represents is this is the unordered This is phi equals zero, right? So this is uh, no order before the phase transition. Here, these are each the ordered states, and this is the point when all of the spins are pointing up, because here the order parameter is equal to 1, so it's just like that picture on the right, and here all the spins are pointing down. And this is not stable. So we have this, so this sort of defines our attractors. When, when mu is less than 0, this is our single attractor, the non-ordered state, uh, parameter is always zero. Um, we tune mu bigger than zero, and we get two different ordered states. They're both stable, um, and the spins need to be up or down. And as we go along this line, that's more and more spins lining up. So here, just a few spins are lined up, and as we go out to here, when uh, phi equals one, all the spins are either lined up, uh, aligned up, or they're either all aligned down. So my question for you guys is: In this case, I drew the picture as if the spins always have to be pointing up, but they could be pointing down. There's nothing preventing that. We just found out that that's actually just as stable as this one. So what, how does the system decide if it's going to be spin up state or spin down state as it goes through the phase change? What do you guys think? Yeah, so it's, it's sort of random. You know, the, I said on average, this thing is equal to zero. So on average, is, is, there's exactly the same number of up spins as there are down spins. Okay, but that's, that's only really true if you have an infinite system. If you have a finite system with, you know, let's say 100 different spins, or let's, okay, let's say 99 different spins, there's an odd number, right? So 49 are going to be doing something, and 50 are going to be doing the other thing. And that's going to, going to randomly fluctuate. And depending on, if there, if there are more upspins, when you go through this phase transition, you'll go up along this line. If there's more downspins, you'll go along this line. So what determines your sort of path here is really uh, randomness. It's sort of like noise.
What do you mean all the other ones? What all the other um, atoms are going. So this represents all of the atoms. This is the order parameter. So it's the average of all of them. How do you get that average? I mean, that's you. The average represents what all of them are going. Exactly. So the idea here is, it's, you're, you're saying the same thing. If the, the average is going to be almost zero, but if I have a finite number of spins, it's not going to be exactly zero. And as I go to this point, maybe the average will be 0 0.0001, in which case it's going to climb up here, because that means that there were slightly more upspins than downspins. If it was minus 0 0.001, then it's going to go up here, because that means there's a few more downspins than upspins. But it's sort of this stochastic fluctuations. In practice, what really matters when you're cooling down a magnet is there's all sorts of um, you know, there's, there's temperature fluctuations going on when you're actually cooling it down. There is some sort of, uh, sort of noise in the system because it's not actually a, a, a lattice like this. It has some defects and it has some impurities. So there's all sorts of complications. But somehow all these complications lead to some noise. And so at this point, um, depending on if it's slightly positive or slightly negative, it's going to climb up here. So this is chaotic because there's a sensitive dependence on the conditions around the phase transition. And as you continue cooling down the system, which is going through here, so I guess I should mention that. Mu equals zero is also T equal to TC, the way, the, the way I've written down mu. When T equals TC, that thing equals zero. Mu less than zero is T bigger than TC. And mu, and over here it's T uh, less than Tc. So um, this is cooling down, as you can think of this. The axis cooling down to go in this direction. And so at Tc, if I'm slightly bigger than zero, if the average is slightly bigger than zero, I sort of lock in that, that phase, the up phase. And as I continue to cool down, that's what grows, the up phase. And so in a sense, it's kind of chaotic. So that might be a little bit confusing. Any questions about this? Um, I want to mention something about this. So this thing here is called a continuous phase transition. And it's continuous because phi went from 0 uh, it went from zero continuously to one. There wasn't a jump in phi. That's not always the case. So there's another type of phase transition where the phi jumps from um, zero to something bigger than zero without any continuity in between. And that's called a like first order phase transition, and that's exactly what ice does or what water does. So as you tune, so in, in water, the order parameter is the average density, and if, you, if you're right above the freezing point, you have some density, the density of liquid water. Right below the freezing point, you have another density, which is the density of ice, and they're different. Um, and there's a sharp transition from one density to the other as you go through the phase transition. And um, so just keep in mind that that's another type of phase transition that exists, a sharp phase transition. And look, that's kind of like what you were saying earlier. It's sort of like there can be these sharp transitions between phases. Those things are called um, first order phase transitions. Do you mean it's, it's still continuous, but the slope is very. No, it's not continuous. It's not continuous, so it just jumps? It just jumps. Oh. It's just... The order parameter just jumps. Now, that seems kind of strange because in nature things are always continuous. You will remember that in between being a liquid and a solid, from chemistry or something, you'll remember that there's, there's a lot of time in between. As you're actually cooling the system down, you have to take all the latent heat out of the liquid to get into a solid. And so during that period, during that time period, you do get a continuous transition in, in, in um, densities, but the temperature is fixed at that point. Right? The temperature doesn't change again until after you get through that, that, uh, that point. So in the scale of the temperature, it's a jump, but in time, it's continuous. Um, okay. So, 
So the last thing I want to talk about is critical points. So there's a lot of special things that happen at the boundary, at the bifurcation point. Right? So this thing right here is the critical point. Um, so in the case of like an icing magnet, what you can do is you can just tune the temperature to the critical temperature. And you can let it sit there and you can measure things and you can observe what's going on. And in all physical systems, you find a couple of interesting properties. One is something called uh, critical slowing down. And what this means is that the relaxation time diverges. in this state here, the spin-off state, and then I went in and I flipped a couple of spins around, the system would eventually go back to equilibrium. So by flipping a couple of spins around, I'm moving it away from its local minimum, its stable point. And it's going to take some time for it to move back into that stable point. It's going to take some time for those spins to flip back up. That's the relaxation time. If I perturb the system a little bit, how long does it take to go back to equilibrium? And when you're near the critical point, uh, this relaxation time gets really, really big. So if you, you can play with this on the net logo thing, if you go to the icing model that you guys are looking at, and you um, go to the, the actual critical point, you'll notice that there's some fluctuations going on. And the thing will eventually settle down. If you're far away from the critical point, it settles down pretty quickly. If you're right at the critical point, it basically never settles down. Or it might take hours on your actual simulation. Um, and you can also observe this in, in real systems. So any sort of oscillation that's happening in the system when you're at the critical point, uh, the time for it to relax is infinite, or, or very, very large for most systems. Um, the sort of cooler point is the following. The um, so-called correlation line. Correlation length, so if I have a bunch of spins, let's say I'm sort of in, I'm in this range where the order parameter is bigger than zero but not one yet, I will have clusters. So I'll have maybe a cluster, cluster of spin ups, and I'll have a cluster of spin downs, and in magnets these things are called domains. And correlation length is sort of the sort of size of each of these clusters. Okay. And when the system is fully ordered, the cluster size is as big as the system, because they're all the same. But as it's going through the phase transition, the cluster size changes. Um, and the important point, I guess, is that you get, what this means is that you get clusters on all scales. And so they have a power law issue. which, as we talked about, means that it's fractal length. So at, at the phase transition, at the critical point, the, you can look at these clusters, you can look at it on the icing model, you'll see that the spatial structure looks like a fractal. And there's clusters of all scales. So that's a really, those two properties are universal. Every single sort of system of a phase transition that people have found, including this bird flocking thing, if you, you know, actually do the calculations, you find that, um, these things are true. Okay, so what I want to do now is I want to actually look at one of these, these models. So how many of you guys got a chance to look at the, uh, the forest fire model on that logo? I just want to need to explain again sort of the setup, what's going on. Would that be useful for you guys? Yeah. No, of course not. Okay, so while this is Stephen, can you 
you make sure this thing turns on. There, is it warming up or not? <coughs>
So I will, I will want to do another thing. There is this sort of like boundary here. The reason for that is because I have a finite system. If I had an infinite size system, this would be completely shut. There would literally be one point at which it goes from the first behavior with basically nothing being burnt to this behavior right here. Um, and so if we think about the percent burned as being the order parameter in this case, um, this is a This is a continuous phase transition, but it's a very sharp continuous phase transition. Okay, so that's the critical point. And that is a fractal. There's very small dots, big dots. This, there's clusters on all sides. So there's correlation lengths on all sides. And it's not just a fluke. I'll do it again. Another thing you'll notice is it takes a long time to burn the critical point. That's this critical slowing down. And the reason is because you get all these sort of you know, nooks and crannies that emerge from the structure, and it has to go through all of these in order to complete the burning. I'll show you what it, it looks very different if I turn it up above 60%. I'll turn it to 70%. And then basically what it does is just burn straight across. Uh, and it does it very fast. And it leaves clusters of a particular characteristic size. So this, this forest fire model, you basically can <coughs> see all of the um, all of the interesting things I just talked about with phase transitions and, and critical points. Uh, a couple points I want to <coughs> mention. Um, at the critical point. The critical point is a very special point because everything is distributed with a power law. Everything is strapped alike. Uh, there's this change in time scales. Um, and for that reason, some people, some smart people have proposed that maybe biological systems are sort of poised at critical, meaning they're sort of in between this phase transition. They're on the boundary of order and disorder. And this might be useful because it can explore so many different scales because of this power law distribution. The problem with that is I had to do something very specific to get this thing to be at a critical point. I had to tune it exactly to the critical temperature, to the critical uh, peak, and if I didn't, it wouldn't be there. So that's sort of a contradiction. We want biological systems to be poised at criticality, but we have to do something very special to, to make systems um, go to critical, criticality, and so it seems unlikely that biology just happens to be there, that it happens by chance. There's another thing that I'm not going to talk about called self-organized criticality. Um, I don't really like the term, but that's what it's called. And the idea is there's systems that without tuning any parameters, they naturally fall to the critical point. And we can get this with the forest fire model if we change it slightly. So rather than starting with uh, a grid of trees, what you can do is you can have trees grow at random points with some rate. And then you can have, rather than starting with fire along um, one edge at a particular time point, you can have what's called them lightning bolts hitting different grid points at random grid points at a particular rate. And um, sort of regardless of the two rates, what will happen is if you start with just a few trees, the lightning will never really strike a tree and the trees will keep growing until they get, um, until there's enough trees that lightning's likely to strike it, at which point um, the trees will start to burn down because lightning strikes them and they catch on fire and the neighbors catch on fire. If the number of trees gets too big, the lightning will hit one of these points um, and it will burn a huge chunk of the trees. And now we'll be back in the regime where there's not enough trees for it to burn. And it turns out that if you actually simulate this for a big enough system, the the system basically always oscillates right around the critical point. If you make the system large enough, very, very big, infinite, it always sits right at exactly the critical point. And so without tuning any parameters, just by these two sort of natural processes happening in this sort of setup, you get critical, and you get um, power law distribution, and you get track structures. So a lot of other physical systems people have sort of discovered that do the same thing, sort of organize themselves around a critical point. And um, really exciting, very recent research has been done on the cortex, cerebral cortex in our brains, 
and they cut out slices of this, of this thing in, uh, in rats, and they put some electrodes um, on it, and they measured the distribution, and it's powerful. So there's really good evidence that our brains sort of set up there's some sort of self-organization. I just want to say one more thing. Um, you can see that everything we talked about in the quarter, like I said, came back sort of in, in, this, in this one simple bump. Um, so what we've really been doing, some people ask some questions, you know, why are we talking all these random map topics? What are they, how are they all connected? They're a toolkit. We have this complexity map toolkit. And using this complexity map toolkit, we can explore these complex systems. And we can really make sense of these complex phenomena, rather than just thinking, oh, that's a pretty picture. So hopefully, with this toolkit, you guys can go and explore more of this. And, you know, as all Stanford kids want to do, change the world. Right? Okay. Thank you.